So, I'm a fan of independent publishing, and I'm a huge fan of literature and translation. But the thing is, when you read a lot of translation, it's rare that you get to talk to the author him or herself. When you're reading, you know, you know there's a barrier. And so I feel incredibly lucky to have Yuri Herrera here tonight to talk about Kingdom Cons, which was actually his debut novel in Mexico as Trabajos del Reino, but is his newest out of three to be translated into English. It's both a contemporary story and a fable. It's a meditation on art. It's a quick-moving crime story, and it's great. It's one of my favorite books of 2017. But all Herrera's novels are great. Francisco Goldman has called him Mexico's greatest novelist working today, and I'm not here to argue with that. So in conversation with Yuri tonight, we have Roy Kesey, who's the author of a novel and two short story collections, and most recently translator of Pola Olashirak's novel in English, Savage Theories, which we have up front. Um, his work has been anthologized widely and included in dozens of magazines. He's based here in D.C., which is a bonus, um, and we're really happy to have him tonight. Please join me to welcome Roy and Yuri to Politics and Prose. Hi. How you doing? Uh, thank you very much. Where'd she go? Lily, thank you for that. That was a great introduction. Um, I am Roy Kesey, and I'm really, really happy to be here. This is uh, my first time on this side of the microphone at Politics and Prose, and I kind of like how it feels. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with Yuri Herrera, one of uh, Mexico's great young novelists and uh, author of uh, three tremendous books that have come into English over the past couple of years. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for doing this. This is great. And thanks to all of you for, for coming out. Um, so, we begin? Sure. Okay. Um, the first thing you've, let's see, you've had tremendous success, uh, won a bunch of prizes, uh, been on a bunch of uh, prestigious year's end lists uh, over the past couple of years with your uh, literary fiction translated into English, but I don't want to start there. I want to start instead with your, uh, with a question about your children's books. You've written two children's books, right? Do they have as many murders? <laughs> well, for, um, first off, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for uh, for uh, for the the people here in, in prose and politics for re receiving us. I have heard about this this bookstore before, but I have never had the chance to be here. I always say that uh, bookstores are the natural environment for this kind of conversation. I, I enjoy a lot coming here. Um, actually, in uh, I have written two children's books. Uh, there's a murder in one of them. <laughs> yeah, and there's and there's a very explicit description of, of, of a corpse, and the thing is this: uh, an editor in Mexico, uh, the the uh, publishing house Sexto Piso, asked me to write um, a book about violence for kids, and when I when when they gave me this assignment, I said yes, of course I, I'm gonna do it. And when I started planning it, I realized that it was a lot a lot harder than what I have thought. And for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that uh, kids don't read because they have to. They read if they enjoy to read. So sh you you can't uh, underestimate them, and you have to respect their intelligence. You know. And when I was thinking, how do I talk to violence to kids that have uh, grew up? Uh, seeing violence all around them in the media and the streets, maybe in their families. So I decided that I was not going to use a metaphor for violence, you know? It's n it was not going to be like, well, suddenly the cop of in the kitchen broke and what are we going to do with this? No, they, they know that they, they have seen this every day. So it's the story of a girl, This I'm talking about the second book called uh, Los Ojos de Lia, in which this, this girl sees something horrible on the street and she doesn't know what to do with that because her parents are not explaining and in the school she doesn't g get the proper explanations and obviously the media don't, uh, don't do that so she has to develop her own ways of understanding this you know and I well I'm glad that you asked about it because um, of, m of all my books this is the one book for which I have received the most uh, um, like the nicest comments 
from people that I don't know that I, I have received messages like well uh, this this uh, this book came at the right moment for me and for my children and thank you and it, it has it's uh, it has been a really nice experience the previous book it's called Estes Minawal it was a really small edition in Pachuca in my hometown and it's just a, a kid that it's uh, that it's uh, lost in a big city suddenly and he gets in touch with this kind of pre-Hispanic fantastic uh, animal that supposedly we all have, which is an awal, and this, the, the, this, this fantastic animal uh, shows him the way back home, you know? It's just a simple thing. But I, uh, I, I like these two, <coughs> these two short books. Nice. Uh, Los Ojos de Lía, uh, Lía's Eyes would be the translation of that title. Have the children's books been translated? Los Ojos de Lía is supposed to be translated soon, but, um, well, someone is working on that, but I, I'm still not sure when it's going to happen. Okay. Uh, Lisa Dillman was the translator of the three adult novels. Is she yes. also doing the children's book? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure about that yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, a quick uh, shop question, if you don't mind. Just wondering what it was like uh, working with Lisa on these translations to the extent that you did. I know sometimes th there's a lot of yeah. back and forth and sometimes there's none. And your the, the register in some of your books fairly often is fairly archaic with, you know, with, with interesting effects and with, mm -hmm. with uh, obvious points, but they're also really hard to translate. And so I'm wondering if you hate translators, is that? No, I think translators ha hate me a little bit. Um, last year I was translating a Joyce Cattle Oates uh, story into Spanish. And when I read the original in English, I said, oh, this is going to be e e super easy. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just going to pretty much transcribe it and I'm going to do it in 20 minutes. And when, uh, maybe on, on the third day that I was working on that and, and I started seeing all the, the nuances on all the details. And at some point I said, why can't she say this in a, in a simpler way? You know, and then I said, oh, I know <laughs> how much translators must curse me, you know. Um, but at the same time it's a really enjoyable challenge um, this book has been translated so far I'm not sure maybe in, into nine no languages Congratulations. And I, uh, thank you and I have been close to <coughs> two or three of the of the translators but with none as close as with Lisa Dillman and not because English is the only language in, in which I can have a, a, an informed opinion, but because she asked for it. I never put pressure on the translators. I always respect the space of the translators. They know the readership better than me. They know the language better than me. And I am open to dialogue as much as they, uh, as much as they demand it. And Lisa wanted to discuss every, every single detail, and she had a lot of questions. So for months, we ha ha uh, we exchange emails daily on on uh, on very different things on the meaning of a of a passage on how to come up with a new solution for something that wasn't an obvious solution in in into English and you were mentioning that I use a lot of archaic language well this is something that I I like a lot to to get words from different contexts and to to put them in this in this other space in which supposedly they don't belong so that they create some tension and i think that uh that that is that kind of uh gesture demands from the translator that the translators also imagine uh I imagine new solutions you know okay. it's not just transcription this is I, I something i always say translation is recreation it's rewriting that's why i always consider uh, the translate translators as co-authors because it's about reimagining the whole story every single word in the book belongs to them as well you know so so once you understand that you you renounce to the temptation of micromanaging or the, to the temptation of uh, intruding into the translators and the tra translators work so so it was a great experience with Lisa okay well on behalf of translators everywhere I thank you for the cobelling um, so let's see the three books that you've had translated into English came out in 2015 2016 and now 2017 right so what happened in 2014? 
Like, how did the how did the dam break? How did this sudden was it? You came to the attention of uh, the publisher or a translator? What was it that broke through? I'll say it. The wall. Actually, it happened years before. I have been telling this anecdote that I'm going to tell again, but maybe I should stop telling it because someday the person who is involved in this is going to come and punch me <laughs> in the face. But anyway, before this, my books started being translated into different languages. They were that the rights for them were bought by a big British uh, publisher, and they are the ones who actually chose Lisa to translate the, the books. So she, mm, and this happened several years before, maybe 2010, something like that. So she translated Kingdom Cons and Science, Science Proceeding the End of the World and sent the first drafts. And this guy, the main publisher of this, this place, he said, this guy is untranslatable, so we're not gonna publish him so you can have the rights back we are not even gonna ask for the money back with which was great because I, I had used it in I, I don't know what <laughs> I mean it, it, it wasn't a lot of money but so maybe it was just beer I don't know anyway uh, so and other stories they said they have heard about the books and they said we want them we don't have a lot of money to offer, which was okay. And I said, okay, but uh, the, my only condition is that we keep the same translator because we have already been working and that was, and that was a, a, a really good experience. And you know, when, when people really want to get things going, uh, you, you don't overthink it or over discuss it too much. So, so it happened really fast and, and they have been doing a, a, a great job. You know? Yeah, they've they've published the the books beautifully. They've done really well. Um, I have ten million dollars that says I know who the big British publisher is, and we can talk about that no, later no. over drinks. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, all right. Well, let's let's shift into. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah I just want to say one last uh, thing about. I'm already I'm already trashing this guy. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so so well after he said that last year. Science Proceeding the End of the World won the Best Translated Book Award. So, I don't know. It's, I just wanted to rub that. <laughs> again. R revenge is fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, congratulations on that, by the way. It's well won. That's the prize uh, put out by uh, 3% at yeah. the University of Rochester in conjunction with, can I say the A word here? Amazon, in conjunction with Amazon. <coughs> What's oh. it? Amazon is involved there? Oh, I mean. They put in some money. Okay. They, they're, they're the money bags. That's all. Uh, right. Okay. So let's let's shift to the the new book, Kingdom Cons. If you haven't seen it already, it's uh, it's superb, um, and it starts off. I, I love the the opening of it. Uh, the translation is really agile, really, really, really well done, um, and I love the opening of it because it does have this sort of archaic or medieval feel to it. Right. For the first couple of lines you are carried along by what you think is a story about a uh, king and a uh, bard. And then guns start showing up, and trucks, and jukeboxes, and slang. And you realize that you're in a different word, uh, world altogether. Uh, one that, uh, is it a spoiler if it's only about the first few pages? I guess not. Uh, one that's actually about a, uh, a world, uh, the world of uh, narcotraficante, a drug lord in northern Mexico in the desert and uh, uh, the artist, uh, a singer, a uh, songwriter, who uh, joins his sphere. And the singer-songwriter specializes in writing corridos. And I was wondering, for anybody who might not know, if you would talk a little bit about what corridos and narco corridos are, and what their role is in the book, and what their role is in Mexican culture more generally. Yeah. Well, c corridos have a, have a long history that start not in Mexico, but in medieval Spain. They, were, they, they come, there are the different theories, but uh, uh, supposedly they come from the Cantar de Gesta, and, and there they were songs that, w that were memorized by these by this, by this, uh, singers, and they would go from town to town telling stories through their, through their songs. And there is uh, something really interesting that these singers were a link in between the lower classes and the upper classes because they would sing both for the ar aristocrats and and f and for uh, for the people. And when and during the conquest, this started happening in in, in Mexico. But the genre 
become really important in the 19th century as a, as a way of talking about um, the stories of bandits especially and that is a very important feature of this of this kind of song because corridos since then have been a privileged way of talking about people of uh, confronting power and people doing things that don't that don't appear in the now we would say mainstream media. So this happened in the 19th century, and then during the revolution, uh, they were a very important way of learning about what the revolutionaries were doing. Afterwards, the corrido started uh, started moving towards other 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 issues like social issues, and then also contraband. And from the 60s, and especially since the 70s, it started talking about this relatively new phenomenon, which was the drug trafficking between Mexico and the, and the United States. Um, a lot of people think that narco corridos are just about praising criminals, but it's not that simple. Sometimes it's about praising them, sometimes it's about criticizing them, sometimes it's about criticizing the government, sometimes it's about remembering the victims, you know. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really, really broad uh, uh, a number of topics that, that the Corrido talks about. And for a lot of people, it is still um, one way in which, in which um, not only criminals, but other kinds of individuals gain their name, you know, they, they earn certain reputation. Mm -hmm. So in this book, <coughs> this, this, uh, th this singer is, is a person who becomes aware of the importance of what he's doing. At the beginning, he, he just thinks that he's singing as a way of survival. And then he he becomes aware that this is also an art, and th this is also a way of of searching for the truth, you know. And this is what part of the tension of the plot, I would say. Right. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned power, and that's one of the one of the questions that the book raises fairly early, is this relationship between art and power. Uh, which goes back, well, pr probably back to the beginning of the species, but certainly back to medieval times, right? Uh, and that's the relationship that the king and the, and the <laughs> artist have. Um, I guess my question in regard to this is, what, how do you define that relationship between art and power um, in contemporary Mexico? I mean, the king controls the journalist. Every, pretty much everyone in this book is named according to their job, right? You have yeah. the artist, the king, the journalist, uh, the heir. Um, and so the, the, the king controls uh, the church, the priest, uh, controls the journalist, controls the music trade, and, uh, and the artist responds to the different pressures that the king and the other courtiers uh, put, put forward. Um, what is the relationship between art and power these days in Mexico? And since you've been living in the United States for a while, have you noticed anything changing here since, say, November? <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of things to say about it. The, 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 the first thing I would say is that this is, this is a perennial discussion in Mexico, a perennial debate. Especially because in Mexico there's there there's uh, there are a group of institutions whose work is to sponsor the the work of artists and intellectuals, which I think is a good thing. But at the same time, um, when whenever powerful people have these tools, they are going to try to use them in their in their favor, you know. And this is something that was not invented by. The, by the pre-regime, this is something that has been happening in every form of government in every country. You know, so this was my model for this for this for this book for this relationship was the relationship between the artists that used to work for kings, and I was always wondering how could they preserve their integrity, their originality, their freedom when th all they do is sponsored by these douchebags that were the, that were the kings that that, th that th thought that they were designed by by God you know and the thing is this when you have these people with the power to surround themselves with other people 
they think that they're what what they have to do is to make them just praise them you know because powerful people have this temptation to put their name in golden letters in buildings all the time you so know? strange or in or in uh, in colors or in their belts it's the same thing the narco the narco aesthetic is something that you can see in the fifth avenue in new york you know and it's something that you could see in the in the in the in the courts in in france and in spain this is this is a um, this is something that has been happening uh, since since the, the, this relationship started so i had been thinking about this for a while and I was living in the, in the border between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez. I spent a lot of time in Ciudad Juarez, and I thought, I don't need to write a novel about uh, a, about the European court. The same thing is happening here. And once I decided that, the whole thing came together for, to, for me. Who was going to be the equivalent of the king? Who was going to be the equivalent of Velázquez or Mozart or, or Bach? And what was going to be their language? What was going to be the landscape? And what was going to be the, 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 the perils, the danger that, that this artist was, was going to face? So it's, it's a reflection a bit uh, about that. But now I, ha I have to say something. When we think about the, the pressures that artists uh, receive, it's not only from the state, it's not only from actual politicians, you know. Right now we were, we were talking about the A word, you know, and, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of different kinds of pressures for, for, for creators. Sometimes it's the market, sometimes it's, it's uh, universities. Sometimes it's uh, I don't know agents. There's a lot of ways in which the work of an a uh, of of an author can be conditioned or can be um, directed in 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 some direction. No? Sure. Yeah, and it's it's also complicated by the fact that the artists are getting some real concrete benefits from whoever it is that's sponsoring them, right? Like at the beginning of the book, w the, w the opening scene, uh, the king happens upon the artist singing in a cantina, and uh, a drunk asks for a song, and the song the songwriter sings, and then the drunk only pays him half of what they'd agreed on, and the king says, pay the artist. And I was on the side of the king for quite a while after <laughs> that, right? Um, and then he shoots the drunk in the head, and that complicated a little bit too. But um, I mean, there there are these real concrete benefits to being able to pay your mortgage or put food on the table. And uh, there's there can be a huge temptation to praise whoever needs being praised to uh, to make those things happen. Well, of course, because you feel that you are part of something bigger than yourself, you know, and you are part of someone who has the power to name, because this was a guy who didn't conceive himself as that before that as an artist he was just this uh, this guy living on the streets that who, who was doing what he could do to survive and suddenly he was in a different category and the guy who gave him that category the guy who gave him respectability was this guy who did this kind of thing not only for him but for a, a lot of other people and this is something that happens in, in in other spaces also. We saw it in the last election in the United States and we see it in every election in Mexico when where people feel that suddenly someone is coming to give them the respect that they deserve, who is listening to them, even though they are just listening to themselves in front of the mirror, you know. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean he appeals to the artist's honor. He doesn't order him to join the court. Yeah. He appeals to his, his honor and his need. Yeah, that's uh, fascinating. Um, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to ask about the opening, but now it's uh, slipped my mind. You, uh, so the, 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 the king and the artist de de develop this relationship that changes throughout the book uh, because the king's, well, among other reasons, because the power relationship between them changes, right? Uh, the artist becomes more powerful within the court to a certain extent, and the king has certain weaknesses that are only revealed later on. Could you talk a little bit about that shift in power? Well, the thing is, um, uh, as you said, in this space, in the, in, 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 in the kingdom, 
every single person receives a name according to what the, what they can do for the for the king. So you have the journalist, but he's not a true journalist. What he's doing is just managing the news in in favor of the king. And you have the jeweler, the guy who is doing just yes the the jewels for for the king. And you have the doctor, but. Even though they have these names that supposedly describe something that they can do in other spaces, they work. They, they actually design only what they can do for this powerful guy. So Lobo, who is the protagonist, receives the title of artist, and he believes that. And he starts behaving as, ar as an artist, and he starts behaving freely, and he starts uh, talking about the truth. The, in the in the way he understands it, so this eventually would clash with the with the way the other guy uh, regards the truth, which is what only what he says is the truth. So this is what um, what will lead to a sort of a confrontation and to a, an epiphany in the side of the of Lobo, the artist, to understand that what he does does not depend of, on on the power of the of the king. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there are different kinds of freedom, right? He gets freedom from hunger when he joins the king's the king sphere, and then and gives up many other kinds of freedom and comes to seek them again later with consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I wanted uh, to talk about was uh, the shifts in in register, the shifts in the language. I talked about the we we talked about the archaicisms uh, at the uh, in the early pages of the book and that show up other places in the book and in in others of your other of your books as well. Uh, and there are also great passages of really contemporary slang that take over. And then there are these little short chapters that I, that I hope you'll find uh, where, the, uh, where we're basically inside the artist's mind and the register shifts way up. We have this, this really sort of high lyrical language that takes over for really short periods of time. And I was thinking we could either talk about that or we could show it. Would you like to read one of those passages? Let's do that. Cool. So this, this short, we're going to read, I'm going to read it in Spanish first. And I, I was telling Roy that I respect uh, Lisa's translation too much to slaughter it with my pronunciation. So that's why I asked him to to read it. I'm going to read it in Spanish. It's, it's a really short excerpt. And this is a moment in which he is, um, it's a moment of wonder, I would say. He receives uh, a present from the journalist because the journalist says, oh, I can see that you like words. So I'm going to give you some, some books. And even though he is a writer, he is an artist, he has not been in touch with books before. So well, in the, in, in the novel, it's not mentioned what books he received. In my mind, I knew what, what books the journalist was, 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 Wh was giving Which ones? Uh, well, do you, do you have any idea? No, no because actually once I, I asked this to someone and someone told me, is it something like this? Oh Let's man, um, I can only be wrong, right? Oh I yeah. have to pick yeah, out of all of the it's books. A, it's a stupid well, there's like there's high like labyrinthine sort of theme, like Borges or or well, Cortázar or. N well, uh, maybe it was there in the package, but I was thinking in Cesar Vallejo that oh that he received nice. a, 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 a. So anyway, the thing is, the journalist gives gives uh, gives him some books, and this is just the moment in which he is just. Um, fascinated with what he just discovered. Son tantas letras juntas, suyas, puestas ahí sin otra cosa que hacer más que fecundar la testa. Son muelen la hoja entre rodillos de insomnio, avisan, hurgan la blancura baldía en el papel y en el mirar. ¿Y qué había sido la hoja sin un trasto del jale, como el serrucho si armara mesas? como la fusca si arreglara vidas. ¿Qué? Pero nunca este despeñadero de arena con brío y propósitos a saber. Tantas letras ahí son, son un destello, cómo se empujan y abrevan una de otra y envuelven al ojo en un borlote de razones. ¿Y qué si perfectas igual rejegas ya se incriminan con miedo al desarreglo? Palabras, tantas palabras, suyas, bronca de signos que se atan, 
son una luz constante, son. Él ya sabía de los libros, pero los repelían como una patria que no invitaba. Y ahora se ha dejado llevar de la mano hasta el acopio de secretos, una luz constante, un resplandor diverso cada una, cada una diciendo el nombre verdadero a su modo, hasta las más mentirosas, hasta las más veleidosas. Ajá, no, no están ahí nomás para fecundar la testa. Son una luz constante, el rumbo a otros cartones lejos de ahí, el descenso a oídos ocultos ahí, como los bichos que lo pueblan. No, no están para nomás entretener la vista ni alimentar la oreja. Son una luz constante, son un faro que se derrama sobre las piedras a su merced, son una linterna que se pasea, se detiene, acaricia la tierra y le descubre cómo acabalar el servicio que le ha tocado. Do you all speak Spanish? Can I just skip this part or? <laughs> you people. <coughs> They are there. So many letters together. His. Put there for no reason but to penetrate his brain. They are there. Milling the sheets between rolls of insomnia, they signal, scratching at the wasted white of the paper, at his eyes. And what was each sheet if not a working tool? like a saw for someone who builds tables, a gat for someone who takes lives. Ah, but never this bluff of sand, the spirit and ambition to uncover. So many letters there. They are, they are a glimmer. How they jostle together and overflow, soaking each other and enveloping his eyes in an uproar of reasons. No matter if they're perfect or unruly, they incriminate, fearing disarray. Words, so many words. An uproar of signs bound together. They are a constant light. They are. Books were something he already knew about, but they had spurned him like an unwelcoming country. And now he'd let himself be led by the hand to the Council of Secrets, a constant light. Each with its own radiance, each speaking the true name its own way. even the most false, even the most fickle. Aha. Uh -huh. Not just there to penetrate his brain. They are a constant light, the way to other boxes far away, the road to ears hidden right here, like the bugs that bite him. Not just there to amuse his eyes or entertain his ear. They are a constant light. They are the lighthouse flare cast over stones at his command. They are a lantern that searches, then stops, and caresses the earth. And they show him the way to make the most of the surface service that is his to render. The end. Thank you. Uh, cool. No. I, I have another nine pages of questions, but I have been given the sign that it is the time for me to stop asking and for you to start. Are there any questions? Hi. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, Thanks to you. So how do you pronounce the, the name of the protagonist in Signs Preceding the End of the World? Is it Makina? Makina. Makina. Mm -hmm. So um, a couple of us read and, uh, and talked about the book a couple of days ago. We thought it was really interesting that Um, you know, she does this, she makes this decision to cross the border to retrieve her brother, right? So she's sort of an agent of her own, of her own fate. But at the same time, she's doing this in the context of a, a much larger system, right? So she's only able to cross the border by carrying across the drug package. And uh, it never says it's drugs. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. Um, all right. So but involved in some sort of larger play of figures, right? So um, I guess, was this something intentional or, you know, it felt like there was a real tension between this individual action and also just these much larger systems, you know, whether it's like global economics or politics. I guess, how do you think about those two? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you. Um, he's asking um, about the protagonist of Science Presenting the End of the World, which is my second novel, the first one that appeared in English. And that's the story of Makina, a woman who has to go to the other side, an unnamed other side, searching for her brother. And she receives the help of certain bosses in the town where she, where she is from. And 
she has to encounter a lot of a lot of difficulties in 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 her voyage, and these difficulties are ch are changing herself. And they are changing the way she sees himself, the way she sees her country, the way she sees the country where she's going to. And um, the thing is, this it's she has to deal with cert with certain realities, and she has to deal with a world of rules created by men for men, and she has to in a way preserve her own her own ethics uh, mm -hmm. in the in the face of this so yeah of course i was i was uh, aware of all the um, like the bigger picture you know because whenever we think about the the drama of the migrants coming to the to the united states or the migrants crossing mexico the problems that they are facing is not that the individual criminals that that, that they encounter in, in 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 there but the whole set of rules that determine that their lives are not worth that their lives are dispensable you know and this it has to do with uh with certain economic rules mm -hmm. with certain ways of uh understanding labor you know so yeah of, of, of course uh, always i'm thinking always i'm thinking in 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 the big social issues mm. but what i try to do is not to create abstract discourses about about them but to see them in terms of singular bodies to see them in terms of singular dramas and th but that dramas are always informed by a lot of other o other decisions that go beyond their individual decisions i don't know if i that's great yeah okay appreciate thank, it. You. thank you hello uh, thank you both for being here un placer tenerlo aquí un honor gracias um i thought it was really nifty that you read the original spanish version and then that you read the translation because uh i'm fascinated by translation there's only a few books that I've read in both languages, just because when I was reading, when I was hearing the Spanish, I was like, I wonder how you how the translation is. For instance, the, the word patria, in my mind, it's like it said country or said homeland. Mm. It ended up being country. Yeah. Um, so th that's my question. When you worked with the translator of this particular book, were there some terms or words, especially meaningful ones, that you quibbled over that 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 perhaps you th you you thought, well, it makes a difference. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if... if uh well, all the time. Because uh, mm -hmm. as I was saying, translation is yet not, not just transcription, you know, it's, right. it's reimagining. Reima and sometimes there you can't find one uh, very precise equivalent. What I say always is that with every translation, there's, there's a, a certain amount of loss because it's not possible th that in the new version you will replicate the exact same meaning of the original version. And when I say meaning, I'm, I'm talking about the silence is also in the in, 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 and the musicality of the, of the original version. But you should embrace that loss because with it, it, ca it, it comes, uh, there comes something new. And this new thing is new meanings, new musicality, new nuances. So uh, in these discussions, um, it depends on the kind of communication you have wi with the translator, but sometimes it's uh, you sacrifice something in order to in order to preserve some other part of the, of the original. Let's say if in the original what you have is certain musicality that goes with that word, but in the in the in the new version you want to preserve the musicality but there's not one word that will do that with the same meaning you just have to make that kind of decision and to i don't know to compensate in some other part of the of the text you know but um one interesting thing is that did this makes you think about the decisions you made when you were writing it originally um this has not happened very often but just a few months ago, I sent Lisa uh, a short story because it was going to be published in a, in a book in English, and she wasn't clear about certain certain words, and she sent me a, a, a group of questions, and as I as I was trying to answer her question, I realized that maybe I could improve my decisions. Yeah. So actually, my my Spanish version changed thanks to to to, to, to what she That's was to what she was asking, and that doesn't mean that I was 
changing in order to make it clear in English because some some of the changes that I made 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 her work even even harder, sure. you know. But but it but but it was a really nice a, a really nice way of looking at your work from this other uh, standpoint, you know. Did, did that experience just give you a chance to look for words that were more evocative, or was it just another a second chance at coming up with a, a, a more descriptive word, or to to be more precise, mm -hmm. to be um, to be less lazy, maybe I would say, yeah. you know, yeah. because sometimes you make decisions that are, that are just are just fine, but that are not as precise as, as they can be. I would say. Great, excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. Hola. Thank you, Yuri, for coming back to DC. I have a question about intertextuality somehow. This is the way I'm going to put it. When you mentioned the book that uh, you had in mind, I would have been wrong as he was, but um, I was thinking, thinking about, uh, I was thinking about Rubén Darío, El mm. Rey Burgues. Mm. So I don't know what's the translation in English, maybe the bourgeois king by yeah. Rubén Darío. And I was then thinking that maybe because of the relationship between the king and the artist, who is a poet in the case of Ruben Darío's book, also it came to my mind that there might be some intertextuality as well with Daniel Sada's novels that are so based on corridos, and he of course is from the border. So I don't know whether you can talk a little bit about this. Oh well, I I, I can talk a, 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 a lot, lot about, about Daniel sure. Sada. Daniel, I think um, Daniel Sada and Jesus Garde. I I would have to put them together. Yeah, I of uh, are two of the best uh, writers in the Spanish language in the twentieth century, and they are not read enough because they are difficult to read. Especially Jesus Garde. It's it's it's. It's very likely that in in a few years he's gonna disappear from from bookstores because he's he's so so difficult. One of his uh, one of his books that I was reading just recently, he spends like five pages just describing how someone is lighting a candle, you know, and and in in this act he there there is a whole reflection on light, on fire, on existence, on shadows. And and it's uh, absolute uh, and on on space, you know, and it's it's absolutely beautiful, but it's uh, it's uh, it's not an easy read. Also, Daniel Daniel Sada, whom I met maybe like a year before before he died, and, and we be became friends. Um, he used to to write in in the syllables. I don't know how you say in English with uh, eleven syllables. Uh, uh, and even even though he, he, even though it was prose, he he was really conscious of the musicality of what mm -hmm. what he was doing. So I have read Daniel Sada by the moment that, that I was uh, mm -hmm. writing this, but I didn't have it in mind as one of my explicit models. You know, mm -hmm. and now this is difficult to say because it, it's it's difficult for an author to s to to really be clear on what uh, the in our influences are. Mm -hmm. Because when we speak about our influences, we are speaking mostly about our desires and about our pretensions, you know? It's like uh, I'm saying, yeah, of course, I was thinking in Quevedo, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, this, <laughs> is to this is totally like that, but, but I always say, I, I have also learned about The Simpsons, you know? Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's okay. And that's actually that I, uh, that is something that I have actively try to do. I think about how we create the lang the our literary language in a kind of orthodox uh, old style way. I think in the figure of the painter that has his how do you say the, the palette, no, with different colors mm -hmm. and he has to mix them in order to create the, the specific tones that he, he's, he's gonna use. And for me this palette includes Quevedo and Sada and Rulfo, but it also uh, includes the people saying saying things in Twitter mm -hmm. and the bad the bad journalists that that while they are maybe writing bad that sometimes they they have some some genius insights mm -hmm. into language and uh, the the really gross language that some of my c cousins have with when when they talk about sex or, or <laughs> whatever you know mm -hmm. so I think uh, in this palette. Uh, 
you can include whatever you want. This is this is our heritage, and we should be proud of of I including there any c any kind of register mm -hmm. of, of of the language. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask a question about timeliness. Um, I was introduced to science proceeding the end of the world very recently at a high-minded Washington bookstore such as this one. Um, a table describing, you know, the the timeliness of the book with with discussions happening in the United States right now about borders and walls and things like that. And I'm curious how that's affected the, perhaps the the ways that your books perhaps unexpectedly tied into the events of the last year. How has that impacted your reception in the United States, and has it has it changed at all the way that you've thought about your own work? Um, well, the thing is this, I I. I never try to write as as a reaction to what is happening. I try to write as uh, li like uh, nurturing myself with what is happening and what I feel is about to happen. And let me give you an example with Kingdom Comes, Cons, the, the, the book that is just, just coming out here. I published it in 2004. And in that moment, the whole drug trafficking and war on drugs discourse was important, but it was not the number one issue in the political agenda as it became when Felipe Calderon came, came to power. You know? And in the following years, several singers um, were killed because they were singing in praise of some of someone or against someone, and some people started paying attention to the book as if I had anticipated this. And what I say is that it's not that I had anticipated this; is th that I was just paying attention to s to certain part of, of of reality. And the same thing with um, regarding migration. You know, I always say. The nightmare didn't start for, for the migrants on January 20th. It started a long time ago. And some of the worst things that hap happened to migrants were doing the, during the Obama years. I mean, I know that this is not a popular thing to say, but really there was a, it, it, there was a lot of, of deportations and made in really inhumane conditions, you know. So... Um, now it's become uh, what has bec what has changed is th is the the hate speech you know and with it uh, the attitudes in, in in some institutions and with some agents and even on the streets I, I, I receive a lot more jokes about hey well, when are you going to go build the wall I don't know for some reason it's, it it becomes a popular it becomes become a, a popular joke nowadays and um, but this this has been happening for a while so. I'm. I don't have the expectation that novels will, by themselves, change the a political situation. Novels work in a in a different scale as uh, fr uh, compared to newspapers. You know, novels work slowly, and what I uh, always say is, is that no novels are not responsible of creating good or m or bad men and women but they are a tool to create more conscious and critical citizens but books are ergonomical they adapt to your brain and they adapt to 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 your morals so whatever you do with a with a book is is your responsibility you know so i guess in 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 some way it's it's been read in under a new light when we have all this hate speech nowadays, but this is but the book is not talking about something that just started happening. You know? Thank you. We have time for one more question. We have time for one more question. <laughs> um, so I, I read the um, uh, signals preceding the end of the world uh, last year uh, because I'm also a migrant. Uh, I'm also from Mexico. I'm also from Hidalgo, actually. Uh, from so uh, Real del Monte. Oh. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's very nice to hear from uh, someone doing something yeah. great and putting the name up <laughs> <laughs> from our state. Uh, and yeah, I actually read it in Spanish and it was very difficult because of some of the words used and uh, I'm kind of curious about the English version. <laughs> it might be easier somehow or not. Um, I want to ask you about your uh, experience as a migrant and as a writer writing, uh, or I don't know if you write here in the States right now if you're 
on a project right now and how's your experience compared to um, writing and being a writer in Mexico? Just the contrast in both places. Well, um, I have been a privileged migrant, you know. I haven't been uh, running away from 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 the police when I'm w when crossing the border, you know. I haven't been running while someone is shooting be behind me. So in that sense, my experience has been very different. Um, um, in in regards to the to the writing from the outside, there, there there's a lot of things that. Uh, one of them is that when you are uh, out uh, out of your country and you and you go back, you realize that some things that you you think that are normal are not normal. That you just get used to them, you know. And at the same time, there are there is there is a big loss in terms of how you relate to language, because for me, it's important to be listening to, to the language when it's not directed at me. And by this I mean that language is always changing. So it's important to listen to it while other people are talking among the, themselves. Not when you, are, you, you go to a store and you ask for a drink or you ask for a book or you ask for whatever. But when you are listening to other people just exchanging, ex ex exchanging words. And I would say that the language that I was that I was uh, listening and that I was using to write in 2004 with this book has changed a lot since since this was this book was published. You know, the, the dictionaries are obsolete objects one minute after they are published because words are always changing their meaning, and this is something that becomes even more apparent when you are outside. And you come and and you go back to 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 your country, and you say, oh, how come they people are not saying padre or 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 chilo anymore? You know, you know, <laughs> and now they or, or whatever you, you know. And, and these these things uh, change all the time. I remember when I was in El Paso, um, in my first year, I was teaching to what they called native students, and by this they meant people or students who were first generation. Uh, living in the United States and it was it, it was uh, really fascinating that when they were speaking English they they were speaking in a very modern English and when they were speaking Spanish they were using the words that they learned from their from their parents or their grandparents and it mm -hmm. was a, a, like a very beautiful peasant Spanish from the 50s, let, let's say, you know, say, uh, and it, and so they were like living encyclopedias, linguistic encyclopedias, and this, is, and this is something that you don't realize so clearly until you go out. I don't know if this has happened to you, you know, when when going back, it, that you and and you realize that the way, the same way your nephews are go, uh, are growing older, the same way the the streets are changing, that same in that same way language is also developing and it's becoming more complex or more beautiful or more violent or a, a lot of different ways you know uh, just a follow up yes. um and for this book uh science president the end of the world did you travel to other areas in mexico or were you um your impression that reflected in in the book comes from other areas or like well, personal experience this is a book about traveling this is a book uh, and what i had in mind as um, you know, there there are several places. There's there's like the the the, the town where she's original from, the Ciudad Cita, the, 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 the small little city, and the Gran Chilango. And what I had in mind was uh, towns in the state of Hidalgo. And by the Ciudad Cita, I had in mind Pachuca, my hometown, or that <laughs> you, read. I'm sure you know, you know well. Um, but I also have done the 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 trip from that area of the country to the border so more than specific places i was thinking about the experience of going through the country until you reach the the border you know okay gracias thank you all right does that end our time it looks like it does thanks again everybody for coming out that was thank great. you all for being here